Um, no, it's been a delight to be with you these uh, several weeks, and just I want to say just how much I've enjoyed uh, the just the getting to know each of you uh, a little better, uh, and some of you I am finally getting your first names correct, uh, and uh, that's a good thing. But I have I'm having a, the time of my life, and so thank you for coming back to hear me again. Uh, you know, I, I maybe you had to, but don't tell me that because uh, I, I think you know I will I will think all of you here by your own free will. Um, <clears throat> last uh, Saturday, I spoke at a connection point and I talked briefly about uh, the question of what was Moses doing when he wrote Genesis 1 and 2. Um, I'm going to, to, to talk about that just again, uh, just on one slide actually, but I am going to uh, ask the question, uh, what is it that Moses was doing in Genesis 1 and 2? And if you remember, I talked then about how um, a speech act thera uh, 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 theorist understand language to be doing uh, basically three things. You know, there's what the tech, there's what the, the person or the text says, uh, what it means, and then what it is doing. And, and speech act theorists have, they call it the locution, the illocution, the perlocution, uh, you know, and, and, and men like Kevin Van Hooser uh, have done some really great work. Uh, but for our purposes, we just need to think about what is it the text is saying? What, is, what does the text mean? And then the really important question, what is the text doing? And if you remember uh, at that time, uh, I talked about how sometimes uh, we have the habit of looking at Genesis as just simply a work of abstract theology. And this is the tendency to see it as something that's dropped out of the sky, not paying attention to its situationalist, uh, 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 its situation, its context. Uh, and so uh, I do think uh, that since the Bible is inspired and it's the inerrant word of God, it does teach uh, divine revelation that would not otherwise not be available. And there are timeless truths that we can discern from the text. But that, that is not uh, that doesn't mean we should ignore the context. One has to pay attention to the context in order to try, really get at what the author is, is, is getting across. And then we talked about Genesis as appropriation. This is the polar opposite of the first position. Uh, the first position has a very high and lofty understanding of Genesis 1 and 2. This position understands Genesis 1 and 2 to be, basically be borrowed from other ancient Near Eastern uh, cultures. Back in the 19th century, uh, through the first part of the 20th century, uh, there was this great explosion of archaeological finds. Uh, and it was a very heady, exciting time for the field of archaeology. May not quite uh, be the level of Indiana Jones, but it was pretty cool stuff. And so the discovery of Egyptian and Sumerian and Babylonian and Canaanite text, uh, and then when we find that they talked about a lot of the things that Moses talked about, you know, creation, uh, flood, things of that nature, uh, there, there was uh, a, a flood of, of literature that argued that Genesis was simply uh, a patchwork uh, uh, piece that in which uh, all of these various sources were cobbled together. Uh, and so what is Genesis? It's just borrowed stuff. Well, you don't find uh, very many biblical scholars who hold to that position anymore, but it has had a significant uh, impact on our thinking about Genesis. Uh, another way of thinking about Genesis, as I talked about, is those who understand it as an accommodation. Well, the Bible is an accommodation. Uh, in fact, not just Genesis, but the, uh, the entire Bible uh, is accommodated to us. And John Calvin himself is the one who, who really does a very good job in his uh, Genesis commentary uh, presenting uh, what I think is the right way to think about accommodation. Um, but accommodation is, uh, it, it, unfortunately, there are those who are abusing uh, that approach and saying that God accommodated himself to error. It's one thing to say he accommodated himself to our level. It's another thing to say that he actually appropriated error. And I think that is using the principle of accommodation in an illegitimate way. Well, then there are those who argue that Genesis should be understood as a polemic. Yes, um, Genesis does engage with other cultures and other ancient Near Eastern uh, myths, but it does so to refute them and overthrow them. Well, <clears throat> I think now we're getting closer to what's going on. I do think that Genesis 1, in many ways, is a polemic. But Moses isn't just mad 
uh, at uh, the the Babylonians. In other words, he, he's not he's not just having an academic uh, dispute uh, with other theologians. Uh, I think that uh, the fifth view uh, is I think the best way to approach it, and this is the idea of Moses as missionary. That what Moses is doing is he is what mission, missiologists call contextualization, and. Uh, uh, I am from Southeastern Seminary, one of the great uh, missionary schools of the world. And I, I get the privilege of working with missionaries and missiologists. And this is something that they, they talk about a lot. And what they talk about is, is that in communicating gospel truth to a, a new and different culture, you have to remember there's not two worldviews at work, but three uh, most of the time, uh, whenever you read a text on interpreting the Bible, otherwise known as hermeneutics, they'll generally talk about the two horizons, uh, the, the worldview of the original author and then the, our worldview, uh, modern readers, and how we are to interpret the text in such a way that merges those two, those two worldviews. Uh, well, missiologists remember that in communicating the gospel to a culture that in which the gospel is fairly strange. There's three that's at work. Uh, there's not only the worldview of the original author, the, the, the worldview of the, of the missionary, but also the worldview of, that, of the recipients of the message and how to translate the gospel into that uh, foreign culture in a way that is done with integrity uh, is, is a challenge. It's difficult. Uh, and so, uh, Looking at what Moses is doing, and, and I'm, what I'm going to say here, there's n nothing original. Uh, there, uh, there are a number of Old Testament and biblical scholars that are beginning to understand and highlight the missional nature of the Bible as a whole, and, and, and the, even the Pentateuch and Genesis in particular. And so there are three, and here's, here's the thing that I want to get across to everyone, is that there are three worldviews at work whenever we're reading Genesis. Uh, there's the worldview of Moses, and there's our worldview, and then there's the worldview of Moses' original audience. And I'm arguing that Genesis was such a smashing success and has had such a profound impact on you and me, and not just you and me, but the whole Western civilization. Uh, it, it operates within a Judeo-Christian uh, heritage that started with the worldview presented in Genesis. And it's had such a formative impact on us that I think it would be safe to say that we have more in common with our worldview, uh, we have more in common with Moses than Moses' original audience did. That they thought like pagans. Uh, you say, well, how much so? Let's remember the children of Israel had spent 400 years in Egypt. And so they were marinated in pagan culture. Uh, pagan thinking permeated uh, the early Hebrews in their thinking, their attitudes, and their worldviews. When Moses goes up on Mount Sinai to meet with God, what do they do? One of the first things they do is they, they, they build a golden calf. That's so strange and so bizarre to us. We think, how in the world can, can they do this? Uh, in, you know, they've just been delivered from Egypt by their God, the God of Israel. How could they so quickly and so easily, and, and to our mind, so flippantly, uh, build this golden calf? Well, it's their worldview at work, and it lets us know that they think very much <laughs> like pagans, and it's a problem that will not just be a problem of the wilderness journey, but it will be a problem that will afflict them all through the Old Testament up until the time of their exile into Babylon. Uh, and missiologists deal with this regularly, where if you talk to, a, to someone who's actually uh, you know, presented the gospel uh, and had a remarkable success, and they have first-generation converts, and they seem to be getting it, they seem to be understanding it, and then they will come up with something or say something that makes the missionary realize, oh my goodness, they still are not understanding or comprehending uh, the biblical worldview. 
So that's very important in reading Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, what is the worldview of Moses' original audience? Well, so let me talk about that. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about is, uh, uh, the, you know, that, that's basically the talk I gave Saturday. I'd like to, I'd like to take the ball and roll it on down uh, the, the field uh, today and see, okay, just what was the worldview uh, that, that uh, Moses is addressing, correcting, and evangelizing? So we're going to talk about Genesis in its ancient Near Eastern context or milieu. And we're going to look at three significant ancient Near Eastern cosmogonies, uh, the, the Egyptian, the Mesopotamian, and the Canaanite. And we are going to compare and contrast those. Uh, and again, uh, I want to express my indebtedness uh, to a number of Old Testament uh, uh, professors who have, have done the heavy lifting on this, and I'm thinking of men like Gordon Johnson, um, John Walton, and John Collins, uh, and uh, John Oswald, uh, first, second, and third John, evidently. And so, uh, <clears throat> they, they, uh, the, these men have done some very, very good work, and so I am gleaning from them, and I just want to acknowledge that right up front. What we find, whenever you look at the ancient Near Eastern cosmogonies, uh, that is, there is this chaotic, unruly element. And whatever creator deity is at work, he is in conflict or he must overcome it in one way or another, uh, in, so, in, in sometimes in very brutal struggles. So let's take a look at it. First, uh, let's talk about the Egyptian setting. It's interesting. We really don't have um, a... a We've yet to find a continuous mythic narrative uh, 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 from the Egyptian archaeo uh, uh, archaeological sites. Uh, what we do have are texts found that are magical texts that are written on the walls of the pyramids, are what they call coffin texts because they're written on the walls of the coffin. Um, and what we find is, is that there's not one, just one creation narrative in ancient Egypt, but rather what we find is that there are different religious centers. Memphis, uh, uh, Hermopolis, Heliopolis, and each of them have their own respective creation myths. Uh, and so what you find <clears throat> is that the Memphite text is, is, the, is the most thorough. It's the longest sustained creation myth. Uh, but other significant creation remarks are found dispersed, like I said, uh, throughout uh, various finds. So what do we have? Well, we find, depending on the cultic center, uh, the main creator god is called by a variety of names. Amon-Re, Atum, Bata, uh, and so these different deities are understood in one way or another uh, to bring about the creation of the world. In each and every one of them, uh, they do not start, uh, they're not eternal. What we find is, is that that which precedes them is the chaotic waters uh, from which they, uh, they, 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 they self-actualize. Uh, what we find is, and you need to understand this about Egyptian thinking, uh, and, it's, and it's almost the total opposite of the way you and I think, uh, think and, and this is in no small part to the influence of Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, Genesis 1 and 2 uh, uh, teaches us that there is that which is divine and then there's that, that which is created. There is a creator-creation distinction. You don't see that in Egypt. Uh, everything is divine in the Egyptian way of thinking. When, you, when they felt the wind blow, they didn't think that there was a... The, that the, the, the sky deity was causing the wind to blow. They thought that was the sky de deity herself. Uh, and so there are no in, uh, material, impersonal forces or things in Egyptian thinking. Everything is deified. The Egyptians lived in a magical world in which all things are entities with some type of vitality. So. What would happen is, is that the gods, the creator deity, whichever one it was, would spontaneously come up from the primeval waters, which they called the nun. 
And so, as uh, Walton says, the primeval waters are called none, and out of the waters that creation emerge, Amon Re emerges from the waters through an act of self creation, and through him develop the other god and goddesses who represent the various parts and forces of nature. And so, what we have and what we see. Um, are various accounts, such as the one where Atom self-actualizes as a primal seed or as an egg floating on the waters. He declares, I am the one who made me. It was, I, it, is, it was as I wish, according to my heart, that I built myself. So he self-actualizes. And as he does, he then uses various bodily fluids uh, to create other gods, goddesses, and entities. Uh, whether he sneezes and uses mucus, sometimes he spits, sometimes he masturbates and uses semen, it's pretty graphic. Uh, and, you know, he uses various bodily fluids to create the other gods and goddesses, and that is how he brings about the, the world. Um, what about the origin of humanity in the way, uh, in the Egyptian thinking? Not much. You don't find a whole lot about humans in the Egyptian creation narratives. Uh, basically, it's rarely mentioned, and when it is, it's said to be, we're said to be the product of the tears of the sun god or something of that nature. And so we find in the Egyptian creation narratives uh, something very different than what we find in Genesis. So what about the Mesopotamian uh, creation myths? Well, uh, there are a number of creation myths. The one that's, that I think is the most interesting and fascinating and significant is the Enuma Elish. Um, and that's the, the Enuma Elish is went on high. That's the opening expression uh, for this text. Um, so this earliest text dates uh, from ancient Sumar. The, 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 the text that we have date from the early first millennium. Uh, but the story is much older, and most uh, uh, scholars believe it goes back to the time of the second century millennium. And uh, its, its account is composed of a number of elements. And here, here, if you've never read the Enuma Elish, um, and most people haven't, uh, let me just say, uh, Game of Thrones has nothing on the Enuma Elish. I mean, when you read it, uh, it is a fascinating, brutal, horrific nasty fight. You have <clears throat> a theogony. Uh, what do I mean by that? It is a book designed to talk about the origins of the gods. In fact, you don't even have the creation of the world until you get to book five. I mean, the first four books are telling about, uh, there's Apsu and Tiamat. Apsu is the freshwater god Tiamat is the saltwater god. These are the two primeval realities. Uh, they're the, uh, from everything, everything comes from these two uh, deities, the freshwater deity, the, uh, the saltwater deity. Uh, Apsu, uh, like I said, is the freshwater. Uh, they have a, and, you, and when you read it, there's a whole litany of, of, of entities, gods and goddesses that they have in the first generation, of which one of them is Ea, the god of wisdom. Then, then it goes through the grandchildren of Apsu and Tiamat. Uh, and, and so you have three generations. And before it's over, it's actually even getting into the fourth generation. And so you have all of these gods and goddesses being created. And here's where it gets really interesting. And they have all of this detail about all the deities being created. But it isn't just a theogony. It's a theopmachy. That's where the story goes. It is an account of the battle of the gods. Apsu, dad, grandpa, and by the time we get to the stories of the battles, he's a great grandpa. For petty reasons, he decides he is sick of his children. He's sick of his grandchildren. And so he decides that he's going to kill them all. He's just going to wipe them out. Uh, the reason is that he gives is, I just, I just don't want to mess with them anymore. They're not worth the trouble. They're too much noise. And so he decides that he's going to kill all of his children. Well, Ea gets wind of his dad's plot. And so at an opportune time, Ea murders his own father. He kills him. He, has him assa he assassinates him. Um, when he goes back and they're all talking about it, you know, and they're all, you know, look, there's going to be heck to pay for this. You know, are you sure this is a good idea? And he, you know, he's saying, 
what do you want me to do? You know, what, what option did I have? I mean, you could almost hear the gangsters talking about, you know, did, did, you know was that hit really necessary? Uh, and so, uh, Ia has, has killed his father. Well, <clears throat> Tiamat is a much bigger, more powerful uh, deity than her husband ever was. Uh, she is a monstrous dragon. And so what she does, she is outraged when she finds out uh, that her husband has been murdered. And so she then assembles this uh, horrific army. Think of uh, Lord of the Rings, where you have, where Sar Sauron's armies or the orcs are created. Well, you have where she just creates all of these and it goes into these various scorpion monsters and um, uh, s serpent monsters and just terrifying monsters and uh, all kinds of, of entities that, uh, I mean, and it goes on, you know, she has created this huge monsters uh, uh, army and they are marching towards uh, her, her offspring, the, the, the gods and goddesses who have all conspired against her husband. And she now has a new lover, Queen Kingu, uh, that is now her consort, and she put him in charge. And, 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 and so when all of the gods and goddesses find out that, this, that she is on the march with her army towards them, uh, the, <laughs> the Enuma Elish describes them as scared witless. They, they are terrified. Their legs are trembling together. Uh, their bowels are failing them. They're just, they're, just, they're, they're just beside themselves. What are they going to do? Because they know they are in really big trouble. Well, there is a fourth generation He-Man by the name of Marduk. And Marduk is just this really spectacular, uh, heroic God. And so they look to him and they say, can... Can you help us? Can you deliver us? And he says, yeah. Yeah, I can take care of it. I can handle this. Um, under one condition. Name it. What is it? You, every one of you, will bow down and make me your absolute ruler. And you will, ne not only for this battle, but from now on, my word will be law and no one will ever oppose me and I will be the ultimate supreme leader. I will be the godfather. And they say, that's great. Do it, man. We don't care. You know, so we have the tremendous battle uh, between Tiamat and Marduk. Like I said, when Apsu tires of the noise of his offspring, he endeavors to kill him. Ea, the god of wisdom, kills him first. And so then Tiamat is so outraged that she and her new Quingu go to war against her offspring. And then what happens next? Well, finally, we have the arrival of Marduk, who is, going, who is the god of Babylon. And the gods turn to Mar Marduk and he says, yeah, I can handle this for you. I'll be in charge. Uh, and what's going on here is, of course, a myth that will justify Babylon being such an aggressive uh, conquering uh, entity. And, and so then what happens is cosmogony. Finally, we get to the creation of the world. You say, what do you mean? Well, what happens is there is a horrific battle. And in that battle, you got, I mean, Marduk, let's, let's get, you know, his, his, the horses that he rides, his steeds, one is called Slaughterer. Another one is called Merciless. I mean, you, you get the idea here of, 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 the, of, of, of the imagery and worldview that's being communicated by this story. And so what happens? Well, Marduk kills Tiamat. Uh, he kills her by shooting an arrow through her mouth. Uh, and he kills her, and as he does... He then takes his, his sword and he slices her in half. He fillets her. And as he cuts her in half, the upper half of Tiamat, he makes the heavens. The lower half, of course, that's the fertile part. That's where he makes the earth. And from Tiamat, he creates the heavens and the earth. And so Enuma Elish says, he, Marduk, divided the monstrous shape Tiamat and created marvels from it. He sliced her in half like a fish for drying. Half of her he put up to roof the sky, drew a bolt across and made a guard hold it. Her waters he arranged so they could not escape. And so you have finally the creation of the, the heavens and the earth uh, in the Enuma Elish. And now 
uh, Marduk has the gods all work it. Well, they don't like that. You know, that's, it's, it's hard work. And so, it's, you know, they are complaining about their burden. So what do they do? They say, we need, we need, we need relief. We've got to have relief. And Marduk and Ea get together and they say, well, what can we do? Let's make slaves. Let's make a, a species of slaves who can, and this is said over and over again in the Enuma Elish, can bear the burdens of the gods, take care of the gods. And so what they do, there's Quingu, the captured consort. He's still living. So they go over and they cut his throat. And as his blood gushes out, and, he, and I know, I, you know when I say it that graphically, you just have to read the Enuma Elish. I mean, as it talks about Tiamat, he's smashing skulls. He's severing arteries. I mean, it's, like I said, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty gruesome and graphic. Um, so what, is, what does Marduk do? I shall compact blood. I shall call, cause bones to be. I shall make stand a human being. Let man be its name. I shall create humankind. They shall bear the gods' burdens, burdens so that they, the gods, may rest. Wow. Pretty different from Genesis 1, don't you think? Well, let me just briefly just take a minute or two to uh, talk about the Canaanite Ugaritic text. The deities of the Canaanites were Baal, El, Asheroth, Anat. And what you have in it is in the Baal cycle of the Ugaritic text, uh, the sea goddess Yam tries to overthrow the pantheon from Baal. And when she does, Baal defeats, kills, and then drinks Yam. Remember, she is the goddess of the ocean. Uh, and when he does, you then have a creation account similar to Enuma Elish. So, let's compare and contrast. There is, what we find, is if you remember what I talked about Saturday, we find where Moses is talking to an audience that is completely immersed in this kind of thinking, this kind of worldview. If you remember what I said, there are three steps that a missiologist takes in communicating uh, gospel truth to a new culture. First step, you allow that culture to ask the questions. In other words, you've got to start wherever they're at. You've got to meet them where they're at. The second step then is, is that you use their grammar. You do speak in categories and terms that they will understand. But third, your answer subverts their worldview and transforms it by presenting them a whole new way of understanding the world. If you think about it, where, where can we see this in other places in the Bible? Well, uh, Paul on the Areopagus, uh, or John does, does this very well in John chapter 1, where he uses the Logos concept. But he doesn't leave the Logos concept where it's at. He baptizes it. He transforms it. Uh, and he turns it into something very, very Christological. So that's what you see going on in Genesis chapter 1. So what are some of the features in common? And these are the common features that, that for that reason, people were trying to say, well, you know, Moses borrowed, uh, or whoever the authors of, of the Pentateuch were. Uh, the, you have a chaotic beginning. I said ancient traditions don't start with nothing. They start with a condition that's, that's unruly, devoid of order, chaotic function or purpose. And, and again, you see in Genesis 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void. And so it was unruly. It was, it was chaotic. Um, and I think the fact that God created the universe with unruliness uh, and, and chaotic features to it should let us know something about the nature of chaos, that it is not intrinsically demonic. It is unruly, but it's not, it's not necessarily a natural evil. Uh, primal conditions of water and darkness. Why does Moses make such a big deal about the darkness, the deep, and the tannin, the sea monsters? Because that really meant something to the original audience. Wherever you and I just read uh, when he talks about at how this, you know, and darkness covered the land, uh, covered the waters, and, uh, and, you know, the, he, and the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. We read something serene and sublime. Uh, the original authors, it, this would have been quite a shocking thing uh, for it to be presented the way that it was. Um, in all of the other ancient Near Eastern texts, the sea represents an enemy, a chaotic uh, adversary. So, 
light in all of, in the creation text, light provides the remedy to the darkness. Our uh, creation by speech, now you don't see that with Marduk, but you do see it in the Mesopotamian accounts, especially in the Memphite theology of the Egyptians, you have uh, where, where he, he, he speaks and it happens. Naming, this is another thing. Uh, today, I mean, think about it. What, name, what names did you name your children? Um, we really, I mean, we, we look up baby names and we try to find names that are perhaps meaningful to us or, or that'll, you know, fit them well or things of that nature. It's really not that, I mean, it's not that profound. Whereas naming had an entirely different meaning in the ancient world. For God to name was for God to take authority over it. That is why when, in Genesis 2, God has Adam in the garden, what does he do? He brings the animals to Adam so that he might what? Name them. Why? It, isn't that, it isn't just some cute little children's story. Look, he called that a giraffe. Isn't that cute? Uh, that's not what's going on. Uh, Adam is exercising his authority as God's representative and steward on this earth, that he is in charge and responsible for the stewardship of all that God has given him here on this earth. And so the naming is a very important thing that one will find. That is why uh, to say something in the name of the Lord is to, in, in many ways, to, to be claiming an authority that God has vested me with the authority to, to say this or call for this in his power. That's why when Jesus talks about praying in what? In his name. That's significant. So why on the, in the Ten Commandments, what is the one thing we're not to do? We're not to take the name of the Lord in vain. It's the idea that, the, that naming is, is, is to claim authority and power. And so that's a very important thing to understand. Um, the separation of the waters. What you find is an organizational principle in all of the creation accounts. Like I said, the Egyptians believed the universe to be a limitless ocean above the sky, paralleled by waters under the earth. They were separated by the god of the air, Shu, and came into being as a space between them. Um, and and sh that, then you had the firmament. And like I said, the Egyptian texts have the concept of a vault that prevents the waters from flooding the earth. The vault is less solid in the Mesopotamian view. Uh, and then you have the seasons and the calendar. The celestial bodies are, are created for signs and seasons. Uh, and then people created, sometimes out of dust, the clay, um, uh, you, or you have in the Mesopotamian account, out of the blood of a god. But you still have the idea of created, uh, humans being created. Uh, and then the notion of the Imago Dei. In the Memphite theology, all of the universe reflects the image of God, but does so in a very pantheistic way. Uh, and the breath of life. In the coffin text, the deity breathes. He says, my life is in their nostrils. I guide their breath into their throats. And so these kinds of expressions and terminologies, this kind of, 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 of way of communicating, Moses' original audience would have got that. They would have, they would have understood where he's coming from. And then one of the primary motifs that one finds in all of the ancient Near Eastern texts is the notion that at the end there is rest. Uh, and like I said, if you remember in the Mesopotamian account, the purpose of, of creating humans is so that the gods can take it easy. We're tired of working so hard at this. And so they were wanting to create a resting place for themselves. Well, for everything that is familiar or in common, uh, they pale in comparison to the contrast. What is different is much greater than what is in common. For example, Genesis is a cosmogony. It is the account of the creation of the world. If you'll notice in the text that I just briefly surveyed, uh, they were all theogonies. If you'll notice what they were given an account of is how the various deities came into being uh, with the various parts of creation the gods of the hills, the gods of the cattle, the gods of the trees. Have you ever had an atheist say to you, maybe you've not, but I have had atheists say to me, do you believe in um, the Norse gods? No. Do you believe in the Greek gods? No. 
Uh, do you believe in the Roman gods? No. Uh, so all of the various entities and deities and gods uh, that the uh, ver various polytheistic uh, societies believe, you don't believe in any of those? No. Well, congratulations. I just believe in one less god than you. You're, you're a 99% atheist. I'm a 100% atheist. Have you ever had anybody say that to you? Or something like that? What I say to them is, congratulations, you're almost up to the level of the Old Testament. Because that was exactly the point of Moses all the way to Malachi, is that the God of Israel is qualitatively, not quantitatively, qualitatively different from all of the other deities that people worship. Those deities are within the order. Our God is outside of it and is the reason for the created order. You don't have the account of Yahweh being created. What you have is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when Moses said to the Lord, who shall I say sent me? He said, I am. Tell them that I am sent you. He is the one brute fact. He is, his existence is the one brute fact. He is the necessary being. He's the one who cannot not be. So there is no creation uh, about God. There is no creation of any other deities, nor is there any development within God uh, presented to us uh, in, in the, our Genesis account. Uh, next, the other texts present creation as emanating from the divine, are created out of divine materials. Remember, Tiamat it would be formed the materials for the creation of the heavens and the earth. Genesis does not do so. Genesis presents creation as fundamentally distinct from the creator. This de-deifies nature. And one of the reasons why in the Western world we believe we can do science and not be committing blasphemy is because we do not think that the created order is divine. Now, I can't exaggerate the impact that that has had upon Western culture and the scientific revolution. Science as a discipline cannot happen whenever you think that it is an act of impiety to examine nature. Uh, and so it is a profoundly important thing that Genesis presents creation not as something to be worshipped and as something distinct from the Creator. Like I said, the Egyptian accounts you have where he creates out of his own self, out of his various bodily fluids, or as the Babylonian account creates out of a dead deity. Uh, Genesis presents God as distinct from creation and above it. And one of the primary motifs, and I think that as, you've, as you heard me tell the story about the Enuma Elish, hopefully the reason I was telling it, and I really wanted to get across the, the brutality of it, uh, the, the violence of it, the nihilistic, fatalistic hopelessness of it for the individuals, the humans uh, that are recipients of this story, that one of the primary motifs, perhaps the primary motif of the ancient Near Eastern cosmogonies is warfare, conflict. Um, they were Darwinist before Darwinism was cool. Remember? What is the primary motif of Darwinism? Survival of the fittest. The strong eat the weak. That is as old as the Enuma Elish. And you have where in all of these, uh, uh, in, in these accounts, you have where the, it isn't that Marduk is virtuous. It's not that there is some type of moral superiority to Marduk. He's just the biggest, baddest kid on the playground. Where, in contrast, Genesis presents God without conflict and without opposition, calling the world into existence and giving it, ordering it, its place and function. Like I said, we read that and then we say, well, of course, that's, you know, if God's God, that's the way he would have done it. That's not, of course, to the ancient first audience. This would have been radical and revolutionary to them. Like I said, what are the pagan cosmogonies doing? They're justifying the violence 
of their culture and their society. I like what Paul Ricoeur says about the Enuma Elish. He said, <clears throat> it will be seen that human violence is thus justified by the primordial violence. How is it that Nebuchadnezzar has the right to go from one nation to the next and subdue, slaughter, and kill? Well, he's worshiping Marduk. Uh, creation, then, is a victory over an enemy older than the Creator. That enemy, imminent in the divine, will be represented in history by all the enemies whom the king in his turn, as servant of the God, will have as his mission to destroy. Thus, violence is inscribed in the very origin of things, in the principle that establishes while it destroys. Think of this for a, fo a, for a moment, folks. What if your worldview is God is violent and he won his place by slaughtering murdering and killing. What type of ethic, what kind of moral norm will that establish for that community and that culture? What is, what is the ethic in this worldview? Very different from the one of Genesis chapter 1. For the Babylonian being told the Enuma Elish, what is your place in the world? Where did I come from and why am I here? You are here to be a slave. You are a, an ant in an ant colony. You are a drone. You are a worker bee. Your purpose is to obey and, and, and serve. There is nothing higher for you. There is no greater hope. There is nothing or no one to redeem you from this situation, there is no savior for you. That is what the Enuma Elish is communicating to its audience. In contrast, when God creates the world and then he plants a garden in Genesis 2, instead of man being created to provide for the gods, God provides for us. Instead of man either being an afterthought or a slave, we are the pinnacle of his creation. And he enters into a covenant relationship with us, a covenant that demonstrates an ethic of love. And even today, all through Western culture, we value, even, even some of the most secular atheists value the notion of love your neighbor as yourself and treat them as you would want to be treated this is a very distinctive Genesis 1 and 2 ethic being communicated to us in a very profound way. Well, the ancient Near Eastern cosmogonies present creation with divine components. Like I said, the sun, for example, are with creatures in conflict with the gods, the Leviathan, the Tannin that are mentioned in Genesis chapter 1. Now, Genesis presents God as overall creation over all the sea creatures. He's the one who created the Leviathan. Uh, and so there is the inescapable indication that the author was devising a conscious polemic against the mythological background of the day, but not just mere polemic. He is transforming and subverting their worldview for the purpose of bringing them to a gracious and glorious truth that the, that the God who has called them first, Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and now called the children of Israel out of Egypt. He's not a local parochial deity. He is their personal God, but he's the one who created the heavens and the earth. And so humans are created in the ancient Near Eastern cosmogonies for tasks for which the gods are weary. Genesis, no, we're God's spokesman. We're God's representative. We are his steward. And this is why we talk about the creational mandate given to us in Genesis chapter 1, that we are to be his ambassadors. God gave Adam a task there in the garden. He told him, make the rest of the world look like this garden. And that was the task given to him. I like what R. Kent Hughes in his sermon on Genesis chapter 1 says. He says, each day of creation attacks one of the gods in the pagan pantheons of the day and declares that they're not gods at all. 
On day one, the gods of light and darkness are dismissed. On day two, the gods of sky and sea. On day three, the earth gods and the gods of vegetation. On day four, sun, moon, and star gods. Days five and six dispense with the idea of divinity within the animal kingdom. Finally, it's made clear that humans and humanity were not divine either, while also teaching that from the greatest to the least, every human being is made, each human being is made in the image of God. This is the message of Genesis. So using concepts they would understand, Moses proclaims to them that Israel's God is completely different from the pagan deities. And it's a glorious gospel. Thank you very much.